Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Sego Ani Buju Endio Wachea Kwekwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So with that as an official call to order, uh, Mr. Deputy Clerk, do we have a quorum? Mayor Patterson, we do have quorum in attendance from council. Uh, in addition to yourself, we have Councillor Doherty, Councillor Hill, Councillor Hutchison, Councillor Kiley, Councillor Neal, Deputy Mayor Oosterhoff, and Councillor Osanek. From staff in attendance are Lanny Hurdle, Chief Administrative Officer, Paige Agnew, Commissioner, Community Services, Neil Carbone, Commissioner, Commu Corporate Services, John Bolognone, City Clerk, Jennifer Campbell, Director, Heritage Services, Lisa Capener Hunt, Director, Building and Enforcement, Craig Desjardin, Director, Strategy, Innovation and Partnerships, Spiros Canelos, Director, Facilities Management and Construction Services, Jenna Morley, Director, Legal Services and City Solicitor, Ruth Nordegraff, Director, Housing and Social Services, Tim Park, Director, Planning Services, Karen Santucci, Director, Public Works and Solid Waste, Lucretia Turner, Director, Recreation and Leisure Services, James Barr, Manager, Development Approvals, Amy Gibson, Manager, Recreation Services, Danica Lockheed, Manager, Arts and Sector Development, Heather Scranage, Manager, Housing and Homelessness. Uh, our meeting host tonight is Ian Sullivan. Our technology associate is Marcus Legacy. Also in attendance are, is John Hader, Supervisor, Special Events and Marketing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we're, we're meeting in committee to hold closed meeting. We discussed uh, two items, one with respect to negotiations with the IOTC union, uh, and second a, uh, regarding the Ontario Land Tribunal appeal for the Elgenberg Quarry. So I will ask uh, the clerks for a motion to waive our procedural rules and have the clerk report. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Hill, that council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting that the rules of bylaw number 2021-41 be waived and the city clerk report. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Hill, that council ratify and authorize the mayor and clerk to execute the collective agreement between the Corporation of the City of Kingston and the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, Moving Picture Technicians, Artists, and Allied Crafts of the United States, its territories, and Canada, IOTC, Local 471, for the period of January 1, 2022 to December 31st, 2023. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving on to the approval of the added, we have uh, the addition of two delegations uh, and also an additional clause for uh, report number 49 uh, and an item of miscellaneous business and communications. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the added, please? Moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor Kiley. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving on, are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, we have no presentations this evening, so we will move to our two delegations. Uh, first, we will invite Gary Cregan to appear before council to speak to clause two of report number 50 received from the CAO with respect to the sleeping cabins short-term locational analysis. And just a reminder to both of our delegations that you have up to five minutes, and then I will open up the floor to members, uh, or questions from members of council. Uh, Mr. Cregan, if you are there. Uh, yes, welcome. I am. Thank welcome. you very much. Uh, can I, I can be heard? And I can be now seen. Okay. Uh, my name is Gary Cregan, and I live in the Reddendale uh, area, just south of uh, Centre 70, where it is proposed to relocate the tiny cabins that have been uh, placed in uh, Portsmouth Harbour, uh, 
during the during the the winter months. Um, I'm speaking in favor of uh, relocating them to uh, Centre 70. Uh, I I believe that uh, the the community is is really in no uh, danger from uh, people moving there. Uh, I took it upon myself to visit uh, the current location and I had the opportunity to meet uh, Crystal Wilson, who is the, uh, I would call her the coordinator. There may be another, uh, another title that she, that she holds. And I also met with a couple of the, uh, the residents there. And I noticed, uh, first of all, that uh, Crystal is extremely committed to this particular project. There is no doubt I spent uh, 30 years in, in Toronto doing very similar work uh, with people that were homeless, had mental health issues. So uh, when I met her, I was, I was quite impressed with her, her knowledge, her commitment to the people there, her commitment to having those that are living there part of the whole process. Um, I was uh, glad to hear that the people that are living there uh, want to move out of the downtown core. And I, I, and I think that makes a lot of sense. That's probably where there are a lot of uh, problems arise. The people that are living in the tiny cabins currently are, are, are a bit older. And I think they then become prey for sometimes younger uh, people who are, are looking to, to cause trouble. So I could understand why they wish to, uh, to move out. Uh, I think too, the program provides 24 uh, seven access. I don't get that with my neighbors. Uh, I, have, uh, I have to deal with my neighbors directly. I believe if there's an issue that the program uh, coordinators would address that and, and deal and deal with it in a timely manner. I, I was very impressed that Crystal also joined the Reddendale Property Owners Association, which is, a, is an association basically of those kind of south of Front Road between uh, Lakeshore Boulevard and Girard. And, and we have a little tiny park at the, uh, at the bottom of the uh, of our area, and I was quite impressed that she joined the the Facebook group uh, to uh, be able to address any questions that came up. Uh, that people, if people had concerns, uh, they could uh, contact her. I think it was very proactive to do that. Um, I'm not going to need my my whole five minutes. I certainly uh, strongly support moving the cabins, it may not be the ideal location, but um, the most ideal location would be permanent housing. And, and they don't have that at the moment. So I, I think Center 7 certainly will fit the bill with the renovations that have taken place as of late on the washrooms and such. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions, members of council? Councilor Hill. Thank you, through you, Your Worship. I, I want to uh, thank you, Mr. Craig, for coming forward tonight to uh, speak to us. And I, I know that your uh, sentiments are not necessarily shared by all of your neighbors. And I'm just wondering if, are, are you getting a sense that there is uh, some more, uh, um, I guess, willingness to, to, uh, to, to try this pilot out uh, among the neighbors uh, than there was initially, maybe? I, I mean, I believe so. When I take a look at, the, the, our Facebook page, which is how we kind of communicate in the neighborhood. <coughs> I see far more uh, supportive uh, people wanting to know when the move is going to happen because perhaps they can bring some cookies up or they can, they can do something to welcome people coming. Uh, I think uh, the lack, if there are the lack of people opposing the uh, cabins being moved here tonight, I think that indicates that most people are happy with it. You get that kind of quiet, silent majority that says, 
it's fine by me. I don't need to, uh, to voice my opinion one way or the other. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Craig, and thank you very much. Uh, thank with, you. With that, we'll move to our second delegation. We will invite Crystal Wilson to speak to council to clause, uh, speak to council regarding clause two of report number 50 from the CAO again, with respect to the sleeping cabins short-term locational analysis. Uh, Ms. Wilson, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> My name is Crystal Wilson. I'm the executive director of our Livable Solutions. I'm actually delegating from within uh, one of our empty, now empty sleeping cabins because my office is full. <laughs> but, um, so you'll have to excuse any background noise because we're still doing some last minute moving. Um, so I just wanted to ask for your support tonight for um, the motion to move um, our little community to Center 70. We're really happy with the facilities that have been provided. We, we we were able to tour um, tour yesterday to see um, to get just to you know make sure how we would fit and op you know operate within um, Center 70, and um, we're really happy with with what we have um, been or could be provided. Um, we've also been really thrilled with the number of neighbors that have reached out to us, including Gary, who came down um, to meet with us. A couple of other neighbors came down to meet. Somebody brought cookies to us already. It's been really nice to be welcomed before, you know, before even moving. Um, and we've been building relationships with the organizations in the in the Reddendale area. So there's a local school that we're looking at. Um, programming with and the community garden we're looking at programming with as well our residents are really excited about new opportunities in the new neighborhood um and we've um we took some of the residents through um at different times to show them you know the facilities that are in the area and they're quite happy with um where they're where they're potentially um their new home will potentially be so i just wanted to say i want to keep it short i just want to say thank you for the opportunity thank you for considering extending the program um a couple of good things have come since the extension that you've uh, offered two of our residents, two more of our residents have accessed um, vital medical surgeries, which we're thrilled with. They've been able to recover here uh, at Portsmouth from the surgeries. Um, and, you know, they're, so we're thankful for any time we get where we can help people work through their medical needs. Um, and as well, we've um, secured a pilot project with Service Canada. So we'll be working with Service Canada to find ways to, to break down barriers for vulnerable population, not just people who are without homes, but also people with homes who are struggling to access Service Canada's services. So we're testing um, a concept that they've developed and we'll be testing it um, for a few months um, and uh, extending a bit of our services to be able to, to help a few more people who might not be living in the cabins, but with the support of Service Canada. Anyways, thank you, and I'm welcome. Any questions you might have. Uh, thank you. Uh, questions from Council. Council Hill. Thank you, Crystal. And, and I'm just wondering, uh, uh, in your experience now with this move, we've had lots of communication over the last uh, couple of weeks, and uh, uh, how are the neighbors feeling? Are you getting, uh, are you, uh, do you feel that we've kind of made some inroads in terms of, of garnering support in the neighborhood? Well, I, I think it's been helpful to have more information available to the, to the potential new neighbors um, around Center 70 because they've been able to see how we've operated at Portsmouth Harbor. We've had a number of comments from our Portsmouth neighbors um, that they don't want us to leave. <laughs> so that's been, no, sorry, um, which uh, which is really nice and it makes us feel good. But um, so far, the, the direct contact I have received has been positive and people looking for opportunities to support and to volunteer and organizations looking at how we can collaborate together to offer services for or programming for residents and and the clients that they serve. So, um, you know, I did I have seen some, a bit of negative feedback on um, social media, but most of it is, um, I would say, is based on um, not fully understanding the program or not fully um, investigating the program um, and, and seeing what we've done in Portsmouth Harbor. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, Ms. Wilson, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so with that, we will uh, move on. We have no further delegations. We have no briefings. 
Uh, we do have a petition bearing approximately 41 signatures with respect to the rejection of the proposal to open the emergency gate on Fairview Road to traffic exiting 1200 Princess Street was submitted to the City Clerk's Department by Andrew Dos Santos on May 10th, 2022 to be referred to the Commissioner for Community Services. Are there any other petitions to present? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, we have no motions of congratulations or condolence. Uh, we have no deferred motions, so we will move on to reports. Uh, first up, we have report number 49 from the CIO. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Deputy Mayor Oosterhoff, that report number 49 from the Chief Administrative Officer, consent, be received and adopted. So there are five clauses. Would anyone like it in their separated? Councillor Neal, clause three. Are there any other separations? Okay, so first we'll vote on the um, everything except for clause three. So clause one, award of contract supply of drainage culvert materials. Clause two, award of contract city hall fire alarm and sprinkler standpipe upgrades phases two and three. Clause four, naming rights for departure lounge of YGK airport. Clause five, supplementary report. Oh, it's already, okay. It's done. Okay, so with those, we will call the vote. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, on to clause three parking license, 80 Queen Street. Councillor Neal. Thank you very much. I'm um, not particularly opposed to this. I'm just curious because I know that's a very busy parking sp spot. Is this the first such request? And at what point? Uh, would we kind of pause to say there's too many rentals, we're losing that daily turnover? And I apologize for not getting this question into you earlier. I was, I had a crazy busy day. So thank you. Commissioner Higabas? Or uh, Ms. Kapner Hunt? Thank you, Councillor Neal, for the question. And through your Mayor Patterson, um, this is um, one uh, spot that's in this lot that's been available for a while. So the owners have used the, the, the spot for many years, and it's just a new owner that's looking to re, retake the, the spot to use for safety for their. Uh, for their property. I don't know if that answered the question. Maybe if you can repeat the question, Councillor Neal. Uh, just at a certain point, if there's too many of the local business people requesting that, uh, an assigned spot, it may create more of a problem because I know that's, I sometimes park there. It's a very busy parking lot. Uh, so uh, just as long as we kind of keep an eye on that and flag it at some point, I'm sure we uh, want to be able to maintain some of that parking for uh, the community at large. So thank you. Yeah, as it, it, it is a parking space, um, that's, that's it's not quite a full parking space. This parking space is a bit smaller, and I know that is a pay uh, a pay lot. This is the only space within that lot that is a monthly uh, request. Commissioner Agnew. Yeah, thank you. And through you, Mayor Patterson, just to add to Ms. Kevner Hunt's response, uh, Councillor Neal, it is only for a one year uh, renewal at this point, but certainly we do look at that relative to the overall parking operation before we agree to enter into the lease and are happy to continue to, to monitor that carefully because your point is well noted on that. Thanks for, thanks for offering that suggestion. Okay, if there's no one else who wants to speak, we will call the vote on clause three. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Okay, moving on to report number 50 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Doherty, that report number 50 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. 
Okay, the first clause is Ontario Land Tribunal Settlement for Official Plan and Zoning Bylaw Amendment. Any discussion? Deputy Mayor Ostroff? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Once again, we have the opportunity before us to make a statement worth something. Tonight, we have the opportunity to reject the recommendation from Planning Department that the expansion of Elgenberg Quarry be approved. Tonight, we cannot say we have not been informed. We all understand the history of non-compliance issues at this quarry, and we understand that the surrounding con community is exhausted with the constant negative impact on their peaceful lives. We have an opportunity tonight to make a statement that will send a message to quarry operators across our province and a message to regulators. We expect better. In all of the issues that we have read and understand, one common theme comes through. Self-regulation does not work. It is an incredibly unfair to the community and even quarry operators. This file has been active since 2014, and that is a long while. The fact that this quarry is not, the fact is this quarry is not ready for expansion still. The ask for an OP and a zoning bylaw extens uh, um, extension is simply too much. It will become the Grand Canyon of our area if allowed to proceed and not something to be proud of. We know better than to support this recommendation. I understand that there are many different levels of oversight for quarry operations. I think it is important that we not hide behind that fact and say it is someone else's responsibility. We cannot pass the buck here. The sum of all the concerns and the, fact that, and the facts that exist all on the pages that have been written say no. This is what matters most. The people have spoken and it is our job as councillors, as, as a city to respond appropriately. We can do this and we should. The people have, sorry, let the, let the Ontario Land Tribunal take all these concerns then relate, that relate to this quarry and make the final decision. One final thought. Dave Monroe, who has been advocating for the Elgenberg community for years, has done a Herculean job of informing us very clearly and very accurately why this recommendation should not be supported. You have read them, we have all read them, and they are soundly presented and bear the weight of truth. Someone once said that truth is like a lion, it doesn't need defending. Let it loose and it will defend itself. That is what we have before us tonight. There are times when we absolutely must do the right thing, and that's tonight. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Uh, thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Councillor Senek? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just have a question about process. So if we um, don't want to, uh, let's see. So if we want, um, we don't want, <laughs> Oh my goodness. We want option two, uh, let's see, which is uh, um, not to, we don't want to, at, o, at the LPAT, we want to support the residents. We don't want to support the staff recommendation. How do we go about it tonight? Do we vote the recommendation before us down and then we can put the option forwards right afterwards or how do we do this? Mm -hmm. So, so Councillor Sanic to that question. So, uh, so right now the recommendation is for the minutes of settlement. So if council wanted to instead uh, fight this at the Ontario Land Tribunal, you would need to vote down the staff recommendation and then present a different motion directing staff to, to oppose uh, the application at the Ontario Land Tribunal. So that would be a separate motion that could be presented on the floor if this recommendation fits. Thank you for helping me with that, Your Worship. <laughs> so um, I do agree with Councillor uh, Osterhoff. Um, I, I do not support the uh, recommendation before us to um, go into the minutes of settlement um, 
uh, right now. Um, okay, so this file goes back to 2015. It was at planning committee. Like the file is that thick from 2015. And then we heard it a few weeks ago again at planning committee. So many issues. We have to understand the size of what this quarry is asking for. Right now it's 57 acres. And if this does get approved, it's going um, up threefold, like an additional 78 hectares in addition to the 57. So uh, that's 132 acres. And uh, we saw at planning committee all the farms, all the homes that surround it, and they're very valid concerns, what I think, of um, the effects on their water. Um, quality and quantity, and it's the water, it's both the quantity and the quality that I have concerns about. We know if there is um, I'm an effect with the quantity, we've heard it before in past applications that it would be the owner of the quarry that would have to supply them water, but we also have water quality uh, for all the surrounding area in that watershed that could be um, affected. and. Um, that really scares me. Uh, we know that there's still lots of issues of um, dust and the noise, and um, <laughs> I, I just feel so sorry for the residents. I really do. So I th um, we also know that s um, uh, some of the residents are also appealing the decision and going to LPAT, and I think it adds strength to their voice if council supports those residents at LPAT to say that we hear you and hopefully then the judges at LPAT will, you know, um, uh, take their, um, I don't know, uh, their concerns, um, validate them because us as council is also validating the residents. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I will, Mayor Patterson, and I recognize you. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to begin with a couple of questions to staff. Uh, so what's in front of us uh, is a decision about whether to, to settle or to fight this at the Ontario Land Tribunal. And I'm just curious, are there any other situations in the province where there has been a similar situation with a quarry where the municipality has fought uh, a quarry expansion at the Ontario Land Tribunal. Sorry, Mayor Patterson. Ms. Morley, would you have a reply to that? Thank you. Sorry about that. Sheesh. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Through you. Um, there is a recent decision from the township of Ramara, which has very similar facts to this. All tribunal decisions are considered on their own merits, but these cases do give us an idea of what the tribunal will consider in its decision. In that case, the applicant sought to expand its existing quarry operations and the municipality did oppose the expansion. A number of the same issues that have been raised uh, by members of council and the public were at issue in that case as well. Ultimately, the tribunal considered the PPS provisions, which direct where these usage should go, and noted that this was an existing quarry with an existing haul route that was close to markets. The tribunal also considered land use compatibility principles under the township's official plan, and noted that the applicant had proposed mitigation measures that would mitigate any adverse impacts from the quarry extension. And so in that case, the tribunal did approve the zoning bylaw amendment and official plan amendment to approve the quarry use. Okay, um, my next question is, is it possible to get an estimate from staff about what the cost would be to fight this at the Ontario Land Tribunal? Just recognizing that uh, we would have to retain uh, legal staff and then uh, bring in uh, uh, supporting experts. Does staff have a range or a ballpark of what that cost would be? Ms. Morning. Through you, Deputy Mayor Osterhoff, similar tribunal hearings have generally ranged from three to five weeks, depending on the number of issues raised. As you've indicated, the city would be required to retain external legal counsel and an independent planner. So for a recent two-day hearing that was similar, the city incurred costs of approximately $16,000. If that rate is applied to a three to five-week hearing, 
conservatively, we'd be looking at about $120,000 for outside planning and legal, plus the cost of any consultants that we would have to retain for issues like water or traffic. Okay, uh, my final question is, and, and I, I very much appreciate and understand the frustrations and the concerns of, of residents. Are there any mechanisms that have been set up to try to address those concerns as to if the quarry was to continue to operate? Is there any vehicle or uh, committee or consultative process where residents would be able to voice those concerns? Ms. Morley? Um, yes, or um, Mr. Barr, go ahead. Thank you, and for you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Ms. Morley can chime in if I have missed any additional points. Uh, if there are concerns uh, for any sort of compatibility or mitigation measure regulated by the province and the rural area, uh, members of the public can reach out to the ministry representatives, uh, both at the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks to voice their concerns, as those matters are generally regulated at the provincial level. <clears throat> Excuse me. Additionally, uh, the applicants, COCO, have set up a community liaison committee who meet with uh, members of the community on a semi-regular basis in order to hear concerns that they may have. So in addition to the regular channels through the provincial ministries, the uh, operator themselves has set up an additional mechanism so that they can have direct public feedback uh, from area residents should there be concerns. Okay, so I'm going to say, first of all, I understand where Deputy Mayor job is coming from. I think that he is standing up for the concerns of his constituents. He's recognizing the issues and the problems that there have been with this quarry. So I fully accept that and want to be able to support those concerns. I think that the issue is for council, we want to make sure that we're able to support those concerns in the most effective way possible, at the same time balancing off the concerns of all of our constituents. So here's the challenge that I have. I feel that by fighting this at the Ontario Land Tribunal, we will spend $120,000 of taxpayer money from other residents, and it's very likely not to be effective given what we saw with the Township of Murrah. So I think that the better choice is to recognize that this may not be the best forum for us to do that fight, to approve these minutes of settlement instead, and then let's fight that fight as needed. We can advocate with the provincial government since they are the regulatory agency. We can push the applicant with this liaison committee. There's lots of things we can continue to do to support residents in this case. We're not dismissing these concerns, we're recognizing them, we're fighting with them. All I'm suggesting is that fighting this the Ontario Land Tribunal is likely gonna spend a lot of money and we're not gonna get the result that we wanted. I think that there's a better approach. So for that reason, uh, I'm going to, uh, to support the staff recommendation. Thank you. I return the chair to you. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Neal. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick pol policy wonky question uh, for the solicitor, if I can. Anybody who has submitted a, uh, a letter to the mayor and council through the clerk will be granted standing at what sounds like an inevitable land tribunal uh, appeal. Is that accurate? Ms. Morley. Through you, Your Worship, no, this matter is already within the jurisdiction of the tribunal and a case management conference was already held on February 14th to establish the participants and parties to the appeal. A number of members of the public have been already granted participant status for this appeal. Thank you, that's somewhat unfortunate, I'm afraid. Um, the, I know uh, in speaking with uh, Councillor Osanek, there's a number of municipalities that as a group have sent a uh, strongly worded appeal to the provincial government uh, to amend the current aggregate policy that seems to be driving this uh, and taking away uh, rights from municipalities to help with the decision making. Um, 
I would be happy to support such a, a motion and uh, I think we could probably get it to the next council meeting, in fact, uh, to join those other municipalities in making that, that request for a thorough review of the current uh, poli provincial policies. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Next is Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. And through you, I'm not sure if you can hear me because I've essentially lost my voice. Can you just confirm? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so, I want to first thank Councillor Oosterhoff, who has lobbied councillors on both the planning committee, of which I'm a part, and also here tonight at council. And I think that a number of the concerns he brings up are more than valid. Um, but what I wanted to ask staff about are the regulatory bodies because the tensions I'm feeling in this debate are between what we hear from residents and what may or may not be validated by uh, the Ministry of Environment, or Environment Conservation and Parks, um, RCA, MNRF. There are a whole bunch of regulatory bodies. So can staff confirm how far and in what ways uh, these, these organizations, both local and provincial, have either kind of corroborated or maybe spoken against some of the concerns that have been brought up? Mr. Park. Thank you and through you, Worship. Uh, there are essentially two separate processes happening uh, right now to enact a quarry. First is the uh, considerations under the Planning Act for municipal approvals, which essentially designates and zones land for aggregate operations. That is really the end, stated end goal for the municipality. Also considering some of our official plan criteria for uh, impacts on our roads and traffic, uh, hydrogeological study, uh, peer reviews, uh, as well as impacts for noise and other matters, which we would typically contemplate under a planning act process. Those have been reviewed by uh, our own internal technical departments, as well as peer reviewers and external agencies, including the conservation authority, as well as the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and MECP. Happening separate to this as well is the Aggregate Resources Act license, which also goes through their own provincial approvals at both the MNRF and MECP level. The real implication, sorry, the real, uh, the real enactment of any sort of movement, permissions on sites, how sites develop, where the berms go, setbacks from lot lines, uh, those are all determined at the provincial level, including hours of operation. All of these details from the studies are built into the site plan for the Aggregate Resources Act uh, license and permissions. So if you look at the Aggregate Resources Act site plan for this site, it contains a series of notes, uh, everything from the dust management plan, traffic operations, when blasting can occur, what kind of drills they can use on the property, how these things can work in tandem or contained on that site plan. Um, that is really what feeds in from all the provincial ministries in order to uh, enable and allow these uh, uh, licenses to be approved and move forward. We have received confirmation from both MECP and MNRF that uh, their matters related to the MNRF site plan under the Aggregate Resources Act have been resolved and they are not an objector to the Aggregate Resources Act appeal, which is referred to the Ontario Land Tribunal to be heard concurrently with the Planning Act appeal process. Uh, so if you look at the list of objectors on there, it's only been referred to the uh, OLT because of the public objections to that property. So uh, both at a local level through our CA and our own review and the provincial level, these matters have been reviewed and been found to be in conformance and acceptable to move forward. Okay, thank you for that. So if I could just clarify, um, through the Aggregate Resources Act, there is no other way to appeal any of the number of uh, considerations that they take other than through the OLT. The OLT is the option for residents or other objectors to see uh, issue with this adjudicated. Thank you and through your worship. Members of the public are objectors to the Aggregate Resources Act license. That license is publicly posted when it is submitted uh, for comment, feedback, and appeal. Uh, so members of the public who are part of the uh, appeal under the Planning Act are also, for the most part, the same who are objectors to 
the Aggregate Resources Act license. The Ministry, uh, sorry, the Ontario Land Tribunal did issue uh, proceedings for the case management conference that happened in February and March uh, of 2022. And the names of the members of the public that are associated with both are posted there. So there are members of public objectors to both. Thank you. Okay. And then finally, I just wanted to pick up on one thing you said in your second response. I'm wondering about uh, peer review. So that the dust study and the acoustic studies peer reviewed. What about uh, the other concerns? For example, anything that Conservation Authority or the Ministry of Environmental Conservation and Parks is looking at? Have other facets been peer reviewed or just the two mentioned? Thank you, and through your worship, the items that have been peer reviewed by the municipality were the noise study uh, that was completed for the property, as well as the the explosives plan for the property. And I, I'm forgetting the actual technical term of it right now, but it's the blast in, there we go. It's the blast impact analysis for the site, which looked at everything from impacts to adjacent neighbors, to the uh, oil and gas pipelines, which go through the property, to the natural features in the area, as well as the hydro resources, which also bisect the property. So those are the two matters that were specifically peer reviewed by the city that were submitted as part of the Planning Act uh, appeals, sorry, Planning Act approvals. Uh, other matters are reviewed by provincial ministries um, and they're shared amongst the internal and provincial ministries, so the MNRF and MECP and the CA all look at those matters, but uh, other matters were not specifically peer reviewed through the municipal approvals process. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, I think I said that was my final, but I do have one more question about um, the public comment, because as we well know, this fourth public meeting that just happened that Councilor Osnick referenced and that Councilor Ustroff participated in, was at one in the morning and all those individuals who stayed up that late uh, put in the comment, how is that incorporated into this final recommendation that we see in the name? Thank you and through your worship, the, the public comments have been coming in steadily since the application was submitted in 2014. Uh, so a number of public comments has attended to the staff report, I believe specifically the one that went at the end of April as a public meeting report to elicit comment and feedback and to reintroduce the application to members of the public, the council and planning committee, excuse me, specifically detailed, I believe hundreds of pages of correspondence that were received on the application to date. So, excuse me, matters of, uh, matters raised by the public have been of consideration the entire time this application has been submitted the staff report that is available this evening specifically reviews the consolidation of all those comments and how they've been addressed through the approvals process, uh, through studies, through consultation. And those how those and that is specifically how those matters have been addressed through the approvals process. So it includes everything from looking at impacts on traffic to the area, relocation of the Rideau Trail, the environmental uh, studies that were reviewed, as well as tree removal and uh, any sort of area of non-compliance, which is actually regulated through the uh, Aggregate Resources Act site plan with the ministry. Okay, thanks so much. <clears throat> Next is Councillor Strapp. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm not, uh, I have a front row seat being on council, but I'm not directly involved with this. I, so I'd like to consider my, uh, my observations as really, uh, representative of what someone from another district might think about this whole affair. So um, you can, it can get quite complicated. There's a lot of detail involved, but basically uh, on a very uh, high level, it's fair to say that it, if it went to planning committee, it's because there was variances needed. There was exceptions to the rules needed by the applicant planning committee needed to approve or deny those exceptions and uh, it basically planning committee was split on that and it, there and, and a lot of time was consumed at planning committee talking about the pros and cons of those exceptions i've got here uh, from councillor osanic a, a page of with 19 points of uh, irregularities that were expected to uh, by approval, ignore basically, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, we've got the mayor's argument that well, we're, we're probably going to waste our money because if we fight this, we'll probably lose anyways. That may be true, but that is a guess, and it's not a reason to not do the right thing. Everybody knows the difference between right and wrong, and if 
this quarry didn't need so many exceptions. It could it could go ahead and be a quarry. It could expand all it wants, right? This this is a case of too much on too vulnerable on the vulnerable population that's around the quarry. It's a very disruptive thing, a quarry. And I think I, I need to draw attention to the uh, climate uh, emergency declaration that we made at the beginning of this term and state the obvious of what a quarry actually does. So is this quarry going to make life better for the people of Kingston. And so therefore we should turn a blind eye to all the exceptions and, and not fight it at the tribunal. I don't think you can make that case. The, uh, the aggregate and the materials that are extracted from the quarry are used to ruin the planet further. It's that simple. We have already overpaved the planet and this is a continuation of that practice. It is not in any way environmentally sound to do any of this. We know that, but we're, we're hiding behind the rules and the regulations and the approval bodies and the various different complexities of the file to avoid the obvious. Maybe we need to spend a little bit more money to do the right thing, fight this at the tribunal so that at least we can hold our heads high and as Councillor Osterhoff said, do the right thing for the people of Kingston. We represent the people of Kingston. We don't represent the private interests that benefit from this quarry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Councillor Hill. Thank you, Your Worship. And, and I, I agree with almost everything that I've heard at the table here tonight. I, and, I, and I congratulate Councillor Councillor Oosterhoff for what he's been trying to do to support the efforts of the residents in that area. But I think we're trying to do uh, a regulatory uh, process or, or address a regulatory shortcoming with a planning process, and they're different. And 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 I think we got to. I, I definitely think we should take up the fight. I definitely think that we should do everything that we can in terms of employing every department at our disposal and all of our partners to address these issues because they're serious issues and they're impacting the lives of those folks. But. What we're talking about here tonight and what the planning committee was talking about is a, is a land use issue. And that's why we're going to lose. So, you know, we, we will spend a lot of money and likely lose at the uh, land tribunal. And we will still carry on this other fight. And I guess what we're saying or what I'm suggesting that we say tonight is that we don't spend all that money in a losing cause. But we do carry on the fight that Councillor Oosterhoff has so uh, uh, um, uh, ably uh, brought to this to this table. So I think there's there's more than one way to look at it. I think we can accomplish the same goals, and I think we can bring sort of our processes to bear and our ability to influence governments at the next level. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully to, uh, to bear uh, to get a real good result for the for that community. But the planning process is different. It's a land use issue, and, and this land use is, uh, uh, you know, fits the bill, I guess, under the rules as they currently exist. So also I will support the recommendation. Uh, thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Hutchison. Oh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> The real difficulty of this, well, people have referred to it, the difficulty is that we have, an, a, we have a planning issue in front of us and it's um, complexly tied up with regulatory problems, which fall under other acts, so which we have, don't have any say about, really, the Aggregate Resources Act and the Environmental Protection Act. And um, so I, I find myself torn as a, to what we can effectively do here. The, um, the, also, this, this particular quarry is more complicated because there's an asphalt plant there and a concrete plant there. And apparently, we don't have very little to no say about any of that. And so my first question to staff is, to ask, can they ascertain that we do not have any jurisdiction over this 
because the uses of the forum. Mr. Barr. Thank you, and through your worship, there are two parts to this site. There is an existing quarry operation which has existing zoning and an approved ARA site plan. And uh, that is on the uh, eastern edge of the site consideration areas. And the zoning permits the uses that are there today, which include those plants. Regulatorily wise, they have to obtain an ECA from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks in order to be able to operate them. So the specific day-to-day -day operation of those is handled at the provincial level and not by the municipality. We've zoned the use to be there. That's a historic zoning provision that is there. Uh, but the specific operations and the regulatory requirements that they have to meet are handled at the provincial level. The expansion area, which is located to the west of that, uh, does not include permissions for an additional or the relocation of the, the concrete batching mixer plant, as well as the uh, asphalt plant. So the expansion area is specifically a quarried area and would not include uh, those two provisions which are existing at the uh, eastern edge of the site where it's already zoned for. Right, so we wanted to oppose this expansion on the grounds that we do not see that the prior owner, owners have, um, have uh, followed the regulations correctly or that we suspect that won't happen in the present and future. Do, do we have any um, legal grounds for that? For making our opposition on the basis of that? Uh, thank you, and through your worship. Uh, Councilor Hutchinson, correct me if I've misunderstood maybe the question. Are you, are you trying to ascertain if we um, have consideration for the past practices of previous owners in the uh, current approvals that are before us today? Uh, yes, that's fine. It's part of the answer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you and through your worship. So to clarify, uh, we specifically look at the use, not the user of the site when we're looking at the uh, regulatory uh, requirements under the Planning Act. So uh, the user is never one of our considerations. We understand that there has been a history of maybe non-compliance or um, of nuisance in the area under the previous owner. Uh, there is a new owner for the site uh, that has uh, been working with the municipality to address issues as well as the ministry in areas of non-compliance with their aggregate resources tax site plan from the previous owner. Uh, part of the consideration for the transfer of ownership from the previous owner to the current owner is actually embedded in the aggregate resources act, uh, which requires or it gives the minister the power to deny uh, the transfer of a license that is not conforming uh, to a new operator or owner. This is also confirmed within their uh, internal documents in, in order to transfer a license. So Coco has been, the, the new owner, has been working to address areas of non-compliance for the existing site plan uh, that they have today. And I understand that there have been uh, complaints made to the ministry around some of these areas, uh, both at MNRF and MECP, and no orders have been issued on the quarry to date. Uh, so that shows that the the new operator owner hasn't had an order issued against them uh, while they've been operating this site. Uh, but we specifically look at the use, not the user. Can legally the municipality support those complaints from the citizens if we think they're justified? Thank you, and, and through your worship, um, I, I may look to Commissioner Agnew for an answer on this one, so I'll turn the floor over to her. Commissioner Agnew? Uh, thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson. Thank you for the question, Councillor Hutchison. So in, in terms of legally, uh, staff are able to continue to help to communicate and bring issues uh, that come in through our processes, certainly recognizing that our community members are interacting with the city and city staff um, a lot more easily in some cases than access to uh, provincial ministries because uh, we're responding within sometimes an hour, two hours, six hours versus uh, sometimes what you get responding um, in terms of provincial ministries. But to your point, I think 
I don't think we bear a legal responsibility. I think we can help to continue to bring issues forward if there are issues that are brought to our attention from a staff perspective and continue to work with our ministry contacts to make sure that they're aware of them and then get seeking updates relative to their action on those matters. It's not something that we can legally force, but it is um, a role that we have done to date and we continue, can continue to do to date as well, I think Councillor Neal also talked about the fact of using some of your political powers to pass motions or do things similar to other municipalities that can put into more official correspondence the municipality's position with respect to some of the public concern that's been brought forward and use that as a political channel in addition to what we could offer at the staff level in terms of communication and coordination of public concern. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question. Um, the difference between option two and option three, um, both are going down the route of refusal. I don't think council would see it as negating what the staff has said or anything like that. The, um, but, um, there was a, the, the prospect of losing and paying a lot of money to do so has been raised, and we've seen it in other municipalities. The question is, is does three do the same thing as two? And avoid those negativities. Ms. Morley? Through you, Your Worship, just for the public's benefit, I think in terms of option two, what you're referring to is council voting against the staff recommendation and electing to fully participate in the appeal in opposition of the applications. Option three would be refusing the staff recommendation and taking no position on the appeal. In terms of option three, this would mean that the city is not leading any evidence in opposition of the applications at the hearing itself. The only evidence that the city would have from the city uh, the only evidence that the tribunal would have from the city would be the staff report that was prepared by planning services that actually recommends approval of the application. Which would be self-defeating. So um, it would certainly wouldn't arrive as where, in terms of presentation, where we wanted, some of us apparently want to go. So, um, The problem from, as I see it, is that if we follow option two, which I, which I appreciate, um, is that we will be doing it, we can be only doing it on uh, planning issues, which for the most part, don't really address the, the residents problems over the years and we don't have any guarantee that the owner is actually going to what practices are going to follow so um that will be enforced by the ministers so it makes it really difficult i mean i mean councilor Ustroff and um, others who don't want to leave the residents are sort of sitting out there you know um take what happens um as far as 30, I can see, 30 seconds. Sure. I'm not sure. But the, as far as I can see, if we opt for the, for the option, uh, we either approve it and let it go, but or we take the option two or three and um, um, do what we can. And perhaps that's comes. Point. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else that wishes to speak that has not already spoken? Okay, so we will call the vote then on Clause 1. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carry, or that loses rather, by a vote of 2 to 7. Uh, Councillor Hill and Mayor Patterson opposed. So at this point, I will now invite Council to put forward a motion to direct staff to oppose the, uh, the tribunal or to take another action. Uh, Deputy Mayor Osterhoff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. And um, I have submitted the motion to the clerks. 
Okay, so we can we see that up on the screen, please? Okay, so uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Osterhoff, seconded by Councillor Osanek. The council directs staff to oppose the zoning bylaw and official plan amendment applications uh, for uh, the given address at the Ontario Land Tribunal, including retaining an independent planning professional to provide evidence on behalf of the city at the hearing on the following grounds. Number one, existing site is not in compliance with provincial setback requirements with respect to scale, house, and office. The structure should be 90 meters from the adjacent boundary. Currently, they are less than 15 meters, long-standing problem. Number two, incomplete noise berm near main entrance due to hydro poles and scale house obstruction and legal setback, long-standing problem. Number three, non-conforming perimeter berms at existing quarry. Number four, inaccurate proposed site plan. Required noise berm at main entrance must be shown. Drainage description on new plan is not accurate. Adjacent asphalt plant and CBM concrete plants are not identified on new site plan. Number five, applicant proposes to operate two quarries as an integrated combined operation and under two different licenses and site plans with different operating hours. This is not a workable proposal and likely causes public impacts in the future. Number six, the operating hours of the CBM and asphalt plant are not indicated on the proposed site plan. Is this, how many points are there? 19 points. Number seven. 2016 hydrogeology study by Morrison Hirschfield is inaccurate respect to drainage in South Quarry, which is radically redesigned in 2019. A peer review is required. Number eight, existing site plan is inaccurate with respect to true location of waste scales and office size and location of berms, drainage ditches. Lack of accuracy has already caused adverse public impacts and lack of amendment has potential to cause future adverse impacts. Number nine, applicant is not clear about future plans for asphalt production. Number 10, adverse odor from asphalt production has not addressed anywhere in the application. Number 11, CRCA has not commented on 2020 planning report from MHBC consultants to municipal planners. Number 12, MECP has not commented on any acoustical emission studies submitted for the application. Number 13, 2021 revised acoustical study by Freefield contains multiple emissions likely to cause adverse public impacts. The emissions include hammer drills, hole ram, drainage pumps, and undeclared truck movements associated with ancillary plants, water and sand deliveries at CBM plant, for example. Number 14, comments, concerns expressed by First Nations group about the applications have not been publicized or considered. Indigenous consultations required under the Aggregate Resources Act. Number 15, by the MNRF's own admission, the site was not properly regulated for years and the current regulatory model of self-reporting does not work. Adverse public impacts have already occurred under this model and are likely to persist in the future. Number 16, the community liaison group established by COCO in 2021 places an unfair onus on residents to ensure compliance and minimize adverse impacts. This relieves the MNRF and MECP of regulatory duties. The applicant originally claimed the liaison committee would include the municipal and ministry representation. This has not occurred. Number 17, annual compliance reports contain inaccuracies over many years and are not properly reviewed by MNRF aggregate staff. Number 18, an independent site audit for noise and air emissions has never occurred. Planners have not shown regard for dust testing in 2015, which confirmed exceedances at the site. Number 19, planners are relying on revised technical studies submitted years after normal application deadlines expired. Commenting agencies, hydro and bridge school boards, members of the public, etc., were not notified of these revisions and were deprived of the opportunity to comment as a result. Okay, now we've, I think to some degree already debated this. So any further debate at this point should only be with respect to the points that are included in the motion. Deputy Mayor Osterhoff, you have the floor if there's anything you want to say. Yes, thank you, Mayor Patterson, and, and thanks for um, this opportunity to present this motion. I don't have a lot to say either because I think we have been through so much together and I think that these points very clearly point um, to um, the concerns that the community has. In actuality, there's there's probably double uh, this list than I forwarded uh, this afternoon, even more. But for this specific list, I also wanna say that I understand that not all these points actually address uh, what we are dealing with tonight. But I wish that we would um, understand that um, even in a foundation of a home, not every concrete block holds. One block doesn't hold it all. It's the multiple blocks here that will hold and, and stand in the end is what we hope to present to the OLT. And so I'm proud of the community that has spoken. I'm proud of what we've put together here, though some will not stand. And I get, understand that in the, in the light of rules and uh, the, the lack
levels of regulatory oversight. I now really understand that better. But it's, it's, the, it's the sum of all the parts, everything working together a little bit and the points connecting that will have the substance we need to, to, um, to uh, reach a, a, su a successful conclusion. Thank you. Great, thank you. Is there any other discussion? Okay, we will call the vote then on the motion. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, on to number two, sleeping cabins, short-term locational analysis. Any discussion? Councillor Hill. Thank you, Your Worship. So this has been a, a challenging file for uh, our community, for sure. And uh, I want to uh, thank uh, staff who I think have worked through uh, our livable solutions to kind of make sure that folks in the neighborhood are, are, are confident that this is a, a, a good and temporary um, location for this program. I think the uh, example that was given uh, in, in uh, Portsmouth probably is the most reassuring uh, um, uh, thing that could have happened. It was, uh, uh, the program was very successful and, and, uh, and I believe that uh, the, the neighborhood really came to support and respond to it. So the concerns though are legitimate and I think we have to start to recognize uh, what, what those concerns are and what the foundation of those are because I don't believe that the concerns in, in Lakeside really reflect the, what happened in Portsmouth Olympic Harbor and, and, the, and the 10 cabins that are moving to the, to the district. I think what it does really reflect is that we've got a big issue with affordable housing, with housing our unhoused unha people, with what's happened in, in Kingstown around the ICH. And I mean, to be honest with you, I think most neighbors that have concerns are concerned that the model that's happening around the ICH, and, and, and I am not one bit critical of the work that the people at the ICH are doing. It's, you know, God bless them. They are, they are saving lives there every day, and we know that. And it's, that's been a model for success, but it has had a dramatic impact on the surrounding neighborhood. And I think people in every neighborhood in Kingston are concerned that uh, that model uh, could um, make its way into their neighborhood too, because it, that has not treated those citizens that live in, in, in uh, uh, directly near or in close proximity to the ICH. They have not been treated well through this process. They have, you know, they, they have very, very legitimate concerns. So I recognize the concerns. I wanna just once again confirm that this is a temporary uh, relocation. So I would ask CAO Hurdle just to confirm that these cabins will be there until the end of September. CAO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, that's correct. The intent is to relocate the cabins um, at uh, the end of September, early October to the uh, Portsmouth Olympic Harbor location. Thank you, so I, I guess that's just a sort of a reassurance that we're, that we're uh, um, and again, the same thing, right? It's, it, that's not a permanent solution. That's, that's a, like we're kind of, a, that's, we're kicking the ball down the road a, a little bit again. We've gotta find permanent solutions I, I think the task of next of the next council is going to be to find housing for all of our unhoused people. That's got to be our number one priority because, you know, this is this is having a, a significant impact on our entire community, uh, and uh, and it's worrisome for people. And we need to uh, alleviate the the suffering of people who are unhoused and the concerns of people who are. So I I, I know that Lakeside will step up and do a great job, just as Portsmouth did, and and. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, everyone from that neighborhood, including the teachers at the school, the people in the garden, community garden, uh, the neighborhood sharing services behind who have, who have already stepped up to say that they want to be involved and help in whatever way they can. So, so my thanks go out to all those community members. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor Doherty. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as the councillor for Portsmouth District, I would like to say it was a huge learning experience for us. It started, uh, we heard similar concerns and I also recognized that those concerns were legitimate and they needed to be addressed and talked about. And we organized a community meeting and we had frank discussions and we respected all of the concerns. It's been a learning experience actually for everyone. The residents of the cabins really learned 
I believe, a lot. They learned about how new li life skills, uh, and that was largely due to the support of Crystal and, and the group and the staff supporting them uh, in the new um, moving from a tent to something that resembled closer to an apartment, certainly normal living uh, instead of living in the rock. Uh, but it was also a learning experience for the community. People discovered that not every unhoused person uh, is, um, is somebody to fear. Uh, that these are people who have ha come on some extremely bad luck. There's one man who drives his wheelchair around the community. I think he knows every person in the neighborhood and they've really built relationships. Um, but I do have, because this is, um, this motion also speaks to returning to Portsmouth, so I have some questions for staff and I just wonder if what conversations you've had with uh, perhaps the, the sailing community in Cork and, and other people in the neighborhood. Thanks. Ms. Nordegraff. Thank you, and through you, uh, Mayor Patterson, just checking my sound and making sure everybody can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, so thank you for that question, um, uh, Councilor Dorothy. Uh, we obviously have um, uh, continued the conversation with the tenants at the POH. Uh, I know uh, I know Commissioner Jugenbos probably can also comment on that, but we have uh, continued to uh, to uh, to make sure that uh, that we align the plan with with the, the tenants. Uh, I know in the report it also has identified some events uh, that work is having. Uh, so there's been continued conversation. Uh, we also have committed uh, and will continue to engage with the neighbors at POH uh, uh, when we are uh, returning or uh, should council approve at a return to POH for the for the winter months. So there's been, I think, a, a very uh, productive ongoing conversation with the various tenants, both at Center 70 and also at um, uh, and, and neighbors at uh, POH. I hope that helps. Uh, Commissioner Hugo Boss. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mayor, and through you. And just to follow up with Director Norgraf, uh, Councillor Doherty, just from a tenant perspective and in the boating community, uh, everyone's very excited to get on with the uh, with the summer, and there's a lot of activity down there. Um, so we'll be we'll be working with all our partners on the site to operate a, a strong marina, but as well as facilitating the events. Uh, Cork is a, a very busy summer, and uh, they've been very supportive of the project, the, the Stephen Cabin project. But they have a lot of work to do for uh, for this summer uh, and right into uh, September. I think their last event is the last weekend of September. So we've got the timing arranged here to, to work with that. And another key uh, tenant, they're they're all important, of course, but the the Brigantine uh, has. Uh, has raised some concerns just with the logistics of the arrangement. So we have committed to working with them as well as Crystal Wilson from OLS to, to, uh, to perhaps find a, a new arrangement for, for, for next season in order to provide a more workable solution there. Uh, but the actual relationship was, uh, was very strong between, uh, between the Stephen Cabins and, and those tenants throughout the, throughout the winter. Thank you for the responses, um, and I'd just like to reiterate that uh, everything that I've heard from the neighborhood, from the community, they're very supportive of the project, and I believe they're looking forward to them returning as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Strapp. Yeah, I just uh, on the subject of the of the marina, I, I'm wondering. Because we heard uh, last time when we spoke about this about the um, the placement of the cabins maybe, and uh, blocking off the passageway, which was a, a concern even in the winter because there are users of the of the site uh, uh, in the winter time, and I'm wondering if staff has uh, got to the point of considering like a slightly different location for the cabins in uh, in October, uh, and if they could speak to that. Commissioner Hugo Boss. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Absolutely, that, that's that's pretty much the number one uh, objective for uh, for the next season at POH. Uh, working with uh, Chris Chafe and his team at uh, the Brigantine uh, to make sure that there can be more um, accessibility to, to the tunnel and other areas, uh, and potentially public washrooms, depending on the time of year. So that is uh, that's very important. Um, and as I said, Miss Wilson has reached out. 
uh, to me personally as well as others to say, let's work together. And she has some ideas. You know, our facilities folks have some ideas. We have to work with fire. There's a lot of, but we have some time and we're going to commit to, to making those changes. Thank you. That's uh, encouraging because I think uh, it is a bit of a new piece uh, to hear in this report that we're thinking of a second winter season at, at the marina. And uh, I, think, I think that if there is a way of, of configuring it so that, uh, you know, it's a win-win, like so that we can have the cabins there, but the other users aren't negatively impacted, uh, I think that would, that would be great. So I'm, I'm happy to hear about that. As far as the um, so comments from Councillor Hill, I, I, I think he's, he, two, two things he said were, are worth uh, underlining. One is that we have a lot of work to do to actually find p permanent solutions for housing because, you know, tents and sleeping cabins are by nature temporary. So now we're talking about a second year of a, of a project that was successful, but, but it, was, it was meant to be an out, a, a in from the cold uh, as a supportive housing project for, um, you know, to help those people right on the edge. And, and it, it did that, but we need to help more people. So that, that point can't be underlined enough. And the other thing is, you know, the, lo the two locations. So now we've got two city facilities, one that's used heavily in the winter because it's an arena, and one that's used heavily in the summer because it's a marina. Uh, and then on the off season, they can complement each other. I, I, we found a, t a, a temporary solution, but there is an overlap, right? I mean, hockey season starts up beginning of October, and people are still using their boats until into at least mid to late October. Usually, Thanksgiving is when people start thinking about putting their boats away. So there's a bit of an overlap there, and um, and I think that's that's one of the reasons we need to be thinking. Of, of, of a permanent location where the cabins can stay year round. It will provide stability to the residents of the cabins and uh, we might find a spot that's just as successful as far as uh, community support. So uh, I, I commend staff for uh, how far we've come so far and I, I uh, compliment our Liberal Solutions for being the catalyst for this uh, this, uh, this successful project, and uh, I look forward to the evolution towards, uh, you know, the, the uh, helping as many of our unhoused uh, citizens as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hopefully there's not too much dissonance coming from this end. The, um, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to um, thank staff for bringing this forward, and, and, uh, and I'm very happy that the, the local council is, is supporting it. And uh, thanks to Crystal Wilson for the work she's done on this. She's had a, um, a clear and impassioned uh, position on the saving cabinets from the beginning, and I think she proved her point and hopefully we'll be able to use more. I also want to thank Councillor Hill for his remarks regarding the uh, ICH in the neighborhood. I thought they were really well balanced and uh, a, a position I've tried to maintain myself. And so I appreciate from that point of view and, and how it recognizes all parties. And um, so my question is to staff, is in line with what Councillor um, Sprout was saying, is do we have plans for extra cabins? And do we, are we pursuing land to put them in? See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So we do, um, in the report, we do mention, actually, I think there are four locations that we have identified as potential long-term or permanent uh, locations that could be explored. Um, two of them are city-owned properties and the other two are privately owned properties and we do need to do a bit more work on those before we bring some recommendations back to City Council. Uh, we know that our living um, OLS has mentioned that it would be beneficial to probably have more than one site because they do work with tenants that have different needs. 
So we are gonna be looking at that as well as part of the reporting back uh, to council. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thank you very much for that. I'm glad to hear we're doing that. And maybe you'll have more for us soon. Um, and so I, I'm more than willing to, to support this and hopefully we'll be seeing more like it as we try to treat the very um, subpopulations of populations of, of homeless who have different needs and different mixes of needs. And um, so that's partly what makes it so difficult. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Okay, we'll call the vote then on clause two. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, clause three, 2021 fourth quarter operating report and creation of new municipal reserves. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, under report number 51 from planning committee. Moved by Councillor Kiley, seconded by Councillor Hill, that report number 51 from the planning committee be received and adopted. Okay, so um, under number one, applications recommended for approval by planning committee, there are two items. Would anyone like either of those items separated? Councillor Sanek? Yes, if we could separate Separate them. them, okay. So we'll deal with them individually. So first up would be application for official plan and zoning bylaw amendment. 1431 McAdoo's Lane. Councillor Senek? I just wanted to speak to number two. Oh, to number two. Oh, I see. Okay. Is there anybody that wishes to speak to number one? Okay. We will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, number two, application for official plan and zoning bylaw amendment 1555 Sydenham Road. Councillor Senek. Sorry, it was then the second one, the other number two, not the I-I, but the number two, sorry. Okay, no worries. Does anyone want to speak to this one? Okay, we'll call the vote then. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Councillor Sanic, this one's for you. Uh, this is under applications with no recommendation from planning committee, but before we do that, uh, because it's not coming forward with the recommendation, I will ask for a mover and a seconder to put it on the floor. Moved by Councillor Hill, seconded by Councillor Osanek. Uh, so that application is on the floor. Uh, and then Councillor Osanek, if I can, before I go to you, uh, I do note in the adage that there is uh, a housekeeping amendment that has been requested by staff. So to make this clean, I'm gonna ask for a mover and a seconder to move that uh, housekeeping amendment and then we will have debate and discussion. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Please move by Councillor Doherty, second by Councillor Hill. And discussion on the amendment. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, so now um, number two uh, is on the floor. So this is an application for official plan and zoning bylaw amendment 347, 349, and 351 Alfred Street, and 507, 521, 523, 525, 527, 531 Princess Street and 555, 557, and 559 Princess Street. Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I was one of the, uh, the three planning committee members who voted against this um, recommendation at planning committee uh, last week. But um, since then, um, what, what I wanted, why I voted no, was to get more information on community benefits. And I wanna thank uh, Commissioner Hugenboss for meeting um, uh, with some of us uh, yesterday and giving an hour of his time to discuss the community benefits calculation more thoroughly. And uh, now um, I understand it better and I don't have the same um, objections. Uh, I just wanna ask the question to staff that after we vote on this um, recommendation tonight, this is the last planning committee recommendation coming to council before the new calculation of community benefits brought about by the province um, in a couple of months this year. Is that correct? Commissioner Hugo Boss? 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Osanek. So that is correct. There will be, uh, Council will be required to pass a bylaw with new um, uh, uh, calculations and stipulations to apply community benefits to the planning application. So, you, so all Council will be seeing those uh, terms and, and have an opportunity to look at that and approve it. It has to be in place by September. And sorry, yes, this is the last one under the old regime to answer your other question. Thank you. Um, so, Your Worship, I want to put, like, I'm ready to um, vote for the application, but I also want to put an amendment um, with, the, with the recommendation. And I'm just wondering, is this where I move the amendment or do I wait? Um, so, do you have the amendment in writing? Yes. Okay. So, maybe if I can, we can have a look at it. And so this is just asking, um, with the money, uh, the $304,000, um, with community benefits, with this recommendation, uh, the, the future plans is to put the money towards um, buying parkland in the Williamsville area. And so what this recommendation is doing is just directing staff to report to council every six months with, um, uh, you know, with the status of how you know any opportunity is coming in Williamsville uh, to acquire parkland. Okay, thank you. So a motion to amend, moved by Councillor Sanic, seconded by Councillor Neal. Uh, again, that report clause, or sorry, that clause two sub one, report number 51 be amended uh, to add the following, that staff be directed to report back to council every six months until the land for park purposes is achieved. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak to the amendment only? Okay, so we will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Deal. Thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, our staff for uh, negotiating with this particular developer. Uh, two, in 2010, uh, we supported the Williamsville Corridor Plan, which was a real, really forward-looking, really good plan. Unfortunately, it didn't quite come to fruition. We had, it was supposed to be primarily six-story, but if people accumulated enough land, they could build up to 10 stories. What that created along that whole corridor was uh, blockbuster. Uh, developers bought blocks of land so they could build 10 stories. Uh, there was also supposed to be parquets, uh, uh, green spaces along the, the corridor. Uh, the developers had we're much more inclined to pay for uh, payment in, par in lieu of parkland, which they did, and all of you suburban councillors should thank the Williamsville Corridor for all of the green spaces that were developed as a result. <laughs> but nothing happened in Williamsville. Uh, this is the first development, thanks to an able negotiation from our staff, that not only has one, but has two parkats. The one parkat will have a public easement, but it'll be owned by the developer, but with a public easement, so the public can use it at any time. And the other will be land, larger parkat will be given to the city as green space. And these are the first two development green spaces that have happened in the Williamsville corridor. Uh, and there's also on top of that over $300,000 in community benefit. And I want to thank staff for uh, following the OP recommendation for this and actually uh, negotiating with uh, members of the Williamsville Community Association in requesting how we, how should we spend this money. 
which is what the Planning Act actually calls for but doesn't always happen with community benefit. Uh, so this, uh, this will be the last 10-story development uh, unless a future council changes our, plan our uh, by planning bylaw. Uh, and that's because this development was applied for prior to the interim control bylaw. So the result is yet one more, but the final 10-story uh, unit that will go into Williamsville unless a uh, future council changes their mind about the six-story height limit that currently exists there. So I uh, am very pleased with this and I'm very happy to support it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, through your worship. I have a question about the process uh, with regards to we, we, ever since we joined council in this term, we've been hearing about the new community benefits and having an opportunity to have input in it as council. And that we now have to have this new community benefits program in place for September. So I'm wondering what, what um, steps we've taken uh, as a city at this point with regards to public consultation and then bringing it back to council and and then keeping in mind there might be an appeal process afterwards. Are we on target to have this completed by September? So, so Councillor Chappelle, that's somewhat out of the territory of the file that's in front of us. You're asking about a policy question. I, I understand it's somewhat related, so I'll allow this one question, but I am gonna ask after this that we, we focus on the application in front of us. So, uh, Commissioner Okay. Eddie? Thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson. Uh, so council may remember a report that we brought in March uh, with respect to how we were spending provincial funding, but we also had some information in there about the community benefit strategy. So as part of, of some of that work, we've retained Watson and Associates who are doing two jobs for us. One is the completion of the financial incentive study relative to affordable housing, but the second component of that is doing the update to our community benefits bylaw. So that work, uh, we engage them in March. Uh, they are working just on pulling together the background pieces that are required as part of the study, but we have a public consultation program related to community benefits that will be uh, facilitated through June and early July with reports going to uh, through committee in August and then to council at the beginning of September in order to meet our legislative timeline. So yes, Councillor, we are on track. That's great news. Uh, with regard to the community benefits bylaw that you're referring to being updated, I wasn't able to find when council actually approved or passed the current bylaw. Can you give me some reference to when I could, where I could find that information? Uh, thank you and through you. So the, the original approval of that councillor would have been facilitated through the city's official plan in 2010. So municipalities have to create an enabling language. Um, so the policies that we have in the official plan right now are the ones that guide us with respect to community benefits. We did undertake some update work in around 2016 where we are looking at changing that framework um, and did some extensive consultation but then the province said that they were going to change the legislation. So we put that work on hold pending the outcome of the provincial legislation, which came a year and a bit later and which we're enacting right now. So what we're working with um, exists in the official plan as it's written out, it's in section 9527. I might be inaccurate on the last part of that, but it's definitely 95. So it gives you the framework for how we calculate community benefits. And that is the enabling policy that we have at this time. Well, I appreciate that. Um, what, what I have concerns with, I, I really like the fact that we're looking at having parkland, but I don't think the parkland is going to be available for $300,000. And so what I'm really concerned with is this, this benefits proposal is based on 2016 data. And certainly we know the housing market and the pricing market has all gone up extensively, more than doubled in many cases. And so even though there was an update in 2020, as reported with our meeting yesterday with the uh, Commissioner um, um, Kugenboss, I still feel that it's undervalued and we're shortchanging our residents, even though that 
the ten dollars was was basically per square foot was related to two to twenty two two three Princess Street, and it's been replicated a number of times since. Yet there's never been an actual motion to council to set the two dollar uh, the ten dollar framework, and so. I'm a bit at odds with supporting this tonight, not because of the project, but just because I think that we're shortchanging the residents by not having a larger value. Okay, uh, thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Okay, we will call the vote uh, on uh, the application again uh, for clause two, subsection one. As amended. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries by a vote of nine to one. Councillor Chappelle opposed. Okay, moving on to report 52 from the Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Osanek, that report number 52 from the Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee be received and adopted. Okay, so there are two clauses. Would anyone like them separated? Okay, we'll vote on them as a whole. So clause one, update to the Kingston Public Market Initiatives in collaboration with rural economic and local food strategies. And clause two, report received from the Arts Advisory Committee. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, report number 53 from the Rural Advisory Committee. Moved by Deputy Mayor Oosterhoff, seconded by Councillor Chappelle, that report number 53 from the Rural Advisory Committee be received and adopted. There's just the one clause, Rural Advisory 2021 Report Card. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, nothing for Committee of the Whole. Information reports, if you have any questions, just raise your hand as I read through them. Number one, tender and contract awards subject to the established criteria for delegation of authority for the month of March 2022. Number two, tw uh, I'm sorry, Councillor Chappelle, go ahead. Yes, sir, your, your Worship. Uh, j I just want, once again, want to emphasize to the purchasing and procurement department that uh, I feel that we should be posting these on Bedingo, uh, not just Bedingo, but uh, um, other bidding sites so that we get more responses to these procurement opportunities, because it's very frustrating to have uh, a, a lack of, a, of, of, of um, competition. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay, moving on. Number two, 2021 development charges reserve fund statement. Number three, the right to disconnect policy. Number four, quarterly report, Kingston Economic Development Corporation, Q1 2022. Number five, update in relation to the Sir John A. McDonald statue, 2022-2023. Okay, we have no information reports from members of council. Miscellaneous business, we have one. A uh, move by Councillor Neal, and then I'm gonna need a s another seconder, because Councillor McLaren is not here. Would somebody second this, uh, this motion? Seconded by Councillor Kiley, thank you. That is requested by Roland Billings, Pete Peterson Basketball League Council proclaimed June 15th, 2022, as Doug Jeffries Day in Kingston. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, on to new motions. We have one new motion tonight. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Stroud. Whereas the Kingston Area Taxi Licensing Commission, oh, I'm sorry, point of order. Councillor Hill. Oh. Sure, wanna take a 10 minute break? 10 minute recess it is. We will reconvene at 8.49.
Okay, folks, it's uh, 8.49, so we will uh, reconvene. Uh, so we are at new motions. We have one new motion moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Stroud. Whereas the Kingston and Area Taxi Licensing Commission, or the KATLC, is the legislated authority for the licensing, regulating, and governing of the owners and drivers of taxi cabs in the city of Kingston, the township of Loyalist. Whereas the KATLC was established in 1989 through the city of Kingston and townships of Kingston, Pittsburgh, and Ernestown Act 1989 as amended. Whereas the city of Kingston and the township of Loyalist appear to be two of the only urban municipalities in Ontario that have a separate legislated commission responsible for licensing, regulating, and governing of the owners and drivers of taxi cabs. Whereas the KATLC governance model has prevented city council from being directly involved in the decision making process as it relates to the licensing, regulating, and governing of the owners and drivers of taxi cabs. And whereas community members and representatives of the taxi industry have raised concerns with the oversight of the KATLC for a number of years, therefore be it resolved that council direct city staff to report back to council by Q3 2022 with information on options to incorporate the licensing, regulating, and governing of the owners and drivers of taxi cabs within municipal services and under city council's oversight. Councillor Hutchison, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> this motion is um, being brought forward because Sorry about that, uh, wait for the clerk. The, um, this motion has been brought forward for because those are a number of years there's been concerns about the um, difficulty in understanding what is happening at the, uh, at the taxi commission and the inability of the city to really respond to the concerns of residents, uh, taxi owners and drivers and, and um, other, other parties. My um, my position on this is that um, it's um, what we need is a more transparent and uh, um, process um, more professionally run. This after years of experiencing various blips and dips and dives of the operations. Sometimes it's really good, and sometimes it's not so good. But the difficulty is when you and encounter problems, you can't really do much about it because it's under a provincial act. Um, as it turns out, we can um, exit from that act and uh, set up our own uh, municipal regulation of the taxi industry, which is, um, I think, what we need now. And I'll leave it at that for now. Or respond if so. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Strub? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Hutchison uh, contacted me about uh, seconding this motion, and when I saw uh, you know the basic wording, I agreed to get it on the floor. Since that time, I've had conversations with uh, people in the industry and other councillors. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, gathered more information. And I think, um, I, I agree with Councillor Hutchison that the, uh, there's been a lack of transparency. So what's being proposed here, as you see, is, you know, a report from staff that uh, on options, and, but, uh, you know, with the ultimate aim of changing the governance structure, uh, you know, in, in a radical way. So maybe I could go to staff right now uh, so that because before we you know vote on this, we need to have our eyes open about what we're voting on. So maybe staff could respond to what uh, sort of general, uh, like what department would 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 look at this, and what would it generally look like in if this motion passes. See you. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, the legal services obviously would be involved as we're looking at a potential transition, but when we're thinking of operations, it would um, mostly fall within the enforcement group. So licensing and enforcement would be uh, the primary lead as far as the operation. So that's what we would be looking at and bringing more details to council. 
Okay, so so that's 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 great uh, to direct to the debate because it it gives us also spin on what the taxi commission itself does. I got some of that insight from speaking to operators and uh, and people in the industry. Uh, the the basic gist of the comments was that for for a long time. Uh, the commission operated independently of of the industry and and provided uh, the rules and the you know the rate hikes and stuff like that, uh, the regulatory functions that need to happen and it, it were the commissioners were people from the community citizens much like you might imagine on any of our citizen boards you know a, a citizen oversight committee but the the question here is like transparency and accountability. So when there are problems, when there's no, when, when things are functioning properly, nobody is complaining, then maybe there's, you know, no need to look at the governance model. But we're getting, we've run into some problems, so we have to, you know, have an idea of what's happened. And, and what's happened is there's, there was a, a wholesale change of, uh, of membership of the commission, and the new commissioners went on a di in a different direction under the name of, uh, of reform. And I, and I actually believe that Councillor Chappelle is uh, well suited for the role of reformer when, a, uh, when a gov he understands governance very well, and he, ha he has nothing but the best interests of the city at heart, and so on. Uh, so I don't think that the problem was with the member of council that was on the commission. The the problem that I'm hearing from the from the members of uh, the public that have contacted me is more that it's dysfunctional now that the uh, that the commission doesn't seem to be acting in the best interests of the industry uh, yeah, as a regulatory body. There's a, there's a little bit there's a balance that needs to be struck, and it seems like that we've lost that balance. So if the city is doing the oversight, then it's licensed and enforcement like we have with our other licensed bodies. And I think uh, that I think that, that there's, it's worth exploring, but I'm wondering if there uh, might be an interim step, like maybe we need to know more about the problems that we've encountered and what that would look like. I haven't written an amendment tonight, I thought about it, but I'm wondering if maybe staff could just um, answer this question. So on the, on the issue of transparency, how, and, and uh, the, the democratic process of having citizens as uh, overseeing the, the process of taxi licensing, how would that look uh, would it be a committee of council? Would it be council itself? How, and who would be accountable to the public if the public had concerns about the way taxis are operating? So, so Governor Strada, I'm not sure if you're asking for the information that staff are going to report back on now, or? I, I guess I'm a little bit more, um, because the, the be it resolve clause is so short, uh, when, if there's a change of governance from uh, an independent taxi commission to, as it says, under city council's oversight, what exact, what does that, does that mean that city council will replace the taxi commission or is there possibly like, would it be under a, a, a committee of council or a different structure? Like what would be the governance structure? See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and through Mr. Mayor. So I, I can't uh, obviously provide the details now, Councillor Stroud, because I think that would be part of the review. But if we look at um, other municipalities, so we know that to our knowledge, we're the only municipality in Ontario that has a taxi commission. Um, other municipalities typically have bylaws that regulate taxi um, licenses and, and taxi fees. So under fees and charges bylaw, that's where council would be in control of establishing those. Uh, and of course, if there was anything in terms of when we think of ride share, those types of bylaws, it would most likely come through the uh, transportation committee. So the environment transportation committee would have a chance to review those applicable bylaw. If I compare that to what we've seen in other similar size municipalities. Okay, that's Council very helpful. How much time do I have? 30 seconds. Okay, so I, I'm gonna ask one more question. The, uh, 
the recent service level agreement that we passed uh, for giving the, that power to the taxi commission of over ride sharing what would happen to that oversight over ride sharing CEO hurdle thank you and through you mr mayor the um, approval by council was for a period of one year so it's going to be up for review and that's something that would be consolidated i'm assuming um, if council wanted to change the way that uh, the oversight and the operations are functioning okay well i'm going to use the rest of my time to propose a deferral to hear uh, more information from staff about how taxi oversight is handled in other municipalities before we before the final vote. Okay, so Councilor Shad, you're putting forward a motion to defer then? Yes, a motion to defer uh, so that staff can return with uh, information on how taxi oversight functions in other Ontario municipalities. Okay, do you have a do you have something in writing? Do you have a time frame? Um, uh, have you? Okay, so I think we're going to need to take a recess for you to, to to discuss with staff how much time would be required, and then craft your amendment. Unless you have something in writing now. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through Mr. Mayor. So that. That work, Councillor Stroud, is work that we would include in our report back to Council. I, if we don't have a direction to do the work, we, we're not going to bring unsolicited information to Council. But if Council would like us to look at other jurisdictions and models, which we have collected a lot of information on over the years, and also report back on how this could look like for the city of Kingston that would be packaged together. It's typical that we would look at best practices at the same time. I, I, I don't know if I'm out of time, but it's just that the way that the be it resolve clause is worded, it sounds like it's a done deal if we, if we vote on this tonight about it, uh, the governance changing. Is that the case? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, the way that uh, staff understand it is just to bring information back to City Council, and then Council can make a decision based on the information that it receives. Okay, so we're, we're getting, we're, the motion is to ask for information. Okay, so the deferral is not necessary, and, uh, and I guess I'm done. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Councillor Neal? Thank, thank you very much. I always get frustrated when somebody defers just before I'm about to speak. <laughs> I appreciate the withdrawal. Um, I'm, I was on the taxi, I think it was still called a commission then, in the 90s. I actually chaired it for a while. And the reason why it ended up as provincial, uh, a provincial mandated uh, policy was because at that time I have to say it was somewhat dysfunctional uh, the, the uh, taxi owners fought against one another they didn't get along with the drivers I think there's a very different type of collaboration that's going on today from what I understand, from talking to some of the owners, talking to some of the drivers. And I think it's really, really important that if it follows the procedural bylaws and the transparency rules that we have as an organization, I think that that can continue. And currently, from what I, I've heard from talking to drivers and talking to some of the stand owners, is that um, they, they were learning certain things, like a 40% increase, which they actually didn't, they tell me they didn't want, because 40% would make them more expensive than Uber and they'd lose riders. And so there wasn't the collaboration and consultation that I think there would be if they were uh, an organization under the umbrella of the city. 
following our procedural bylaws and following our transparency rules. And so that's why I'm quite happy to support uh, the motion that stands before us because I think it'll give, uh, it'll give us an opportunity and give the industry an opportunity for greater input. Uh, and I appreciate that uh, Councillor Chappelle has worked hard on this. Um, we, we all received, or at least four or five of us, I think, received an email uh, with several attachments a half an hour or 40 minutes before tonight's council meeting. And I haven't even had an opportunity to read them yet, but I will be reading it and and taking into consideration some of those uh, points that he's making. But I think, uh, I think that should be shared with our staff as part of their uh, looking into this whole process. So I definitely support the motion that's before us. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Doherty. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. I support this motion. I know I, I was on the commission before the pre, uh, just previously, and I know the previous commission did discuss this in detail, actually, and met with the CAO Hurdle and the city solicitor a couple of times uh, because the commission recognized that it could be done and might be better uh, for the city to actually um, incorporate the licensing, regulating, and governing of the taxi commission, uh, of the taxi industry. So um, I think it's worth for us to learn uh, from the report that will come to council in Q3. And, um, and I just want you to know that the previous commission actually discussed this and explored it. We never did end up making a decision in this regard, but I, I believe now we'll hear more information that will help us make that decision. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, Your Worship. In terms of um, professionalism, in terms of transparency, I have a few comments to make. I took uh, over after Councillor Doherty, and um, we had a bit of a wholesale change in our our management in September of this year with the new commission. Uh, as far as transparency is concerned, we published all of our meetings on Facebook Live, published all of our minutes. It's very accessible. We have adopted the procedural guidelines for procedural bylaws that the city uses with delegated attendance. If there's a motion uh, an issue on the agenda, we have allowed delegates to uh, or represent themselves and speak for five minutes. Prior to this, it was basically a free for all. Nothing was organized. There was discussions, cross talk through the meetings. It was, it was very chaotic, very, very much a, a wild west. So in terms of professional organization, we've spent a lot of time with regards to uh, doing a strategic plan. Uh, we did do a lot of consultation. There was discussion about raising the rates before the September of last year. Uh, we were asked to hold off. We did that. We did a survey. We consulted with the community. And then we had issues at the nominations committee with Councillor Hutchison. And Councillor Hutchison, we attempted to reach out to him and discuss the misinformation that he was propagating and uh, no response. In fact, Councillor Hutchison has never contacted me to talk about the positive changes that we made to the industry since this time in terms of governance and outreach. In terms of the recent issue of the 40%, this was an issue that was discussed. We had open um, meetings on this, and it, I can't explain why the taxi industry chose not to participate at the, at the window of our consultation period. When they came back with information after this had closed, we took their input into consideration and in fact, uh, made a recommendation for 20% increase as they're asking for. But we, we also adjusted not only the drop rate, which I'm not gonna get into all the details on, 
but there has been consultation and discussion. And, um, and so I, I find it a, a bit offside that Councillor Hutchison would actually bring forward a motion like this without even consulting with a member of the, the representative here for the city of Kingston. Needless to say, not even consult with the representative for the township of Loyalist Township because potentially this has a significant impact on Loyalist Township, who's been a community partner in this whole process. So, you know, it, it's a bit frustrating to, to spend 10, 15 hours a week on this particular commission and then, you know, be slapped in the face like this. Uh, you know, um, so I, I'm not going to support this. And I would ask that uh, allow the taxi commission to continue to thrive, make positive change, implement the SLA with ride share, and then revisit this after the next election if it's so inclined. But it's not something that uh, I feel is, is appropriate at this time, and therefore I will not be supporting it. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Uh, Councillor Hutchison, you have the last word on your motion, so I'll come to you last. Uh, Deputy Mayor Osterhoff, would you take the chair? I will, Mayor Patterson, and I recognize you. Thank you. So I appreciate the comments both from Councillor Chappelle, the current representative on the Tax Commission, and also Councillor Doherty, the previous uh, representative as well. Uh, I think it's important for Council to keep an open mind here. I certainly have not jumped to any conclusions about what the, the best route forward is. Uh, I do think that the Taxi Commission, there was some certainly some concerns about the proposed fee increase, but the t Taxi Commission also demonstrated their ability to be able to hear from the industry and from representatives and be able to make uh, what I thought was the right change. Um, so I think that we should all reserve judgment here, and I think to be clear that we're not making any decisions tonight. Um, if this is just asking for more information, then I think that's fine. I think Councillor Chappelle raises a good point, though, about Loyalist Township. We shouldn't forget about them, that they are partners with us in the Taxi Commission. So I did have a conversation with the acting mayor of Loyalist Township, and he was of the same mind. He said that uh, it's good to have an open mind, and if it's just a right now request for more information, then that would be fine. Uh, but certainly the word was, let's not make any decisions until we understand better exactly what those trade-offs are. So having spoken with my colleague uh, in Loyalist Township, I think if that's their approach, then I think it's fine to, to ask for more information. But I'm not at all clear necessarily what's the best route. I'm sure that there are going to be costs, and there are probably pros and cons on both sides. So I think Council should be aware of that, and we'll see what comes back from staff. Thank you. I return the chair to you. Okay, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? <coughs> Councillor Hutchison, you have the last word. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> I suppose I should uh, um, respond to Councillor Chappelle's um, comments, although I'm really rather disinclined to, to do that because um, my concern comes from Hearing from numerous people, including the cab companies, including drivers and the residents. And what I've tried to say is it is not just about the current commission and um, his uh, idea that they reached out to me. I, I reached back, but it just didn't happen. And I dropped it for quite a while, the whole issue of the tax commission. But lately, there's been issues, including the 40% rise, which were impossible to ignore. And it just seemed like not a great business decision. So that's been corrected, I suppose, but only through great angst. It has to be understood that the taxi industry is part of the city's transportation strategy. This is very clear in the downtown area where people of uh, modest means and who don't own a car and or don't own a car are uh, using the tax industry with regularity. And also that um, I have one of the companies in my district. I can't, uh, so this is part of my animus for bringing this forward as was commented by Councillor Neal and Councillor Doherty. These issues are not new. And I thought, well, you know, 16 years on council, maybe we ought to do something about it. And um, 
So I'm sorry that the current commission and Councillor Chevelle could be feel caught in the in the, in the um, crosshair, so to speak. But um, when I talked to Councillor Chappelle long before this meeting, the um, I said, you know, maybe you should see it in a historical context and, uh, and step out of the way. So anyway, this is all about transparency and accountability. Councillor Chappelle and the current commission would make certain claims <clears throat> to me and then I heard counterclaims by former commissioners, owners, residents, and frankly, I couldn't find a common ground to figure out how that works, all work together to get into a coherent picture. So that is a big animus for this motion. It shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be really difficult for the city council to figure out what's happening and some parts are true, some parts are you know, nebulous. But who needs that? That's not the way to govern. So that's, as I say, part of my strong animus for bringing this motion. And the motion is, as we can see, ask for a report on options. CAO has made that really clear. Um, the mayor has made it clear about how we should probably look at this. When we see the report, we will be much clearer about what we should do. So it's really about information, about um, trying to assess what our options are and where we might go or not go, as the case may be. So I ask you to vote for this motion and get this process moving forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote then on new motion number one. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries by a vote of eight to two. Councillor Chappelle and Deputy Mayor Osterhoff opposed. Okay, uh, moving on. Are there any notices of motion? Uh, seeing none, uh, Mr. Deputy Clerk, I'll ask for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor Kiley, seconded by Councillor Neal, that the minutes of special city council meeting number 11, 2022, held Tuesday, April 26, 2022, and city council meeting number 12, 2022, held Tuesday, May 30th, 2022, be confirmed. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have a number of communications. Is there any other business? Mr. Deputy Clerk, ask for minutes, or uh, for bylaws, please. Moved by Councillor Dorothy, seconded by Councillor Osanek, that bylaws 1 through 8, 12, 13, and 11 be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Dorothy, seconded by Councillor Osanek, that bylaws 2 through 8, 12, 13, and 11 be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Doherty. All those in favor? Opposed? And we're adjourned. Thanks very much.